Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join this. If you're watching this live, this will be recorded, you'll be able to access this. And if you're watching this recorded, hello, welcome. Um, this is a topic I'm really excited to share on. I can't believe we haven't done this workshop yet. Um, we've been throwing events for pretty much five, six years, which is crazy, and have learned a lot. And with talking with some of my staff, Recently, I've learned that, I don't know, so much of this is kind of mysterious and there aren't a lot of resources and materials about this stuff online. So here we are. Uh, I guess the only disclaimer I will have is this is a course based on my personal experience in the side of the industry, truly been a learn by doing situation. And we are throwing events um, pretty much usually on like the 250 capacity. So obviously things would be a little bit different when you're having events for thousands of people. Um, but we've done the DIY to more formal approach, and we'll talk a little bit about our show history. And yeah, this is what we've learned along the way. Oops. So I'm just going to give a little bit of context with some of the Luna shows that we do um, and kind of an overview for getting a show together, what you need. Then we'll do a little bit. We'll talk about the venue side of things, everything from how do you even get in touch with a venue to what do those uh, contracts look like. And then we'll go to booking talent and all that jazz. And then kind of the not so fun, but really important stuff. So promotion and selling tickets and what your kind of checklist is and day of things and all that jazz. And then we'll have time for questions. So let's dive in. I want to make sure that I'm recording. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. So as I mentioned, you know, Luna, we've been throwing events since 2018. Started off doing backyard shows at USC and Los Angeles. I took a DIY like music event class essentially in school and we were required to throw a concert for our final and so we did a lot of like the DIY scene stuff we played at plenty of sketchy venues and art show stuff in downtown LA and then quickly have grown into formal venues across LA San Francisco New York Austin we've even done a handful of shows in London so like I mentioned from like kind of the DIY art shows to full concerts to South by Southwest uh, workshops, we've definitely gotten a, a full range of experience for this stuff. So today we're going to cover kind of the timeline for a successful event, like how much time should be giving yourself to book something and get it together. And then, like I mentioned, scouting a venue and what venue terms tend to look like, how to book talent and kind of manage expectations there. And then, of course, promoting your event and all the fun little boring checklist stuff. So how far in advance should you be booking? This is a question that I get asked a lot when it's the day of a show, like, hey, when did you start working on this? In a perfect world, two to three months is ideal. Um, you can get something together last minute. We've all been there. I don't love doing that. It's very stressful. So two to three months gives you time where you're not stressed about it. Hopefully you're not panicking. Um, you're allowing time for people to get back to you. One thing that you will quickly learn if you haven't already people are not always as timely as you are when it comes to emailing. So while you might respond within like a day or two to an email, artists that you're trying to book might not. So two months gives you enough time to kind of play the game of this venue wants to know what artists we have, but the artists want to know like what their uh, schedule is like and they got to coordinate with bands, like yada, yada, yada. So better to start earlier. Minimum two months is ideal amazing if you're working more in advance of that that being said you could of course get something a little bit more last minute if you can get things together um we don't tend to promote shows to like three weeks out more or less sometimes two weeks and we have had definitely a handful of shows where we weren't able to announce or promote until like two weeks prior so there's a range but if you care about your mental health, try to give yourself two to three months. This also gives you time to really map out your vision and get a venue and lineup that aligns with what you want. Um, not saying that every show, whether it's an art show, a concert needs to have a theme or this great big vision. Like the vision, it could be, I want to throw a, sh a concert and book three artists or the vision is I just want to showcase my work in an art show. That's totally cool. But if you have something specific in mind and you really want to bring something to life and you're wanting kind of a venue and uh, a lineup that aligns with that, that also gives you that extra buffer room. Venues for concerts will often want a lineup secured before you get a date, but then artists are going to want a date before they confirm. So it's like a weird back and forth situation. It's a very annoying game. And as you start to build relationships up with, my dog's barking, as you start to build relationships up with venues, they will often trust you a little bit more when you're like, hey, like, I'd love a date in 
August, like trust that I can get an artist, uh, you know, a venue together essentially or line up together. So that's also why I say give yourself some time because as mentioned, it takes a while sometimes for people to respond. So all in all, that's why I'm saying the two to three months. Can you get something together quicker? Of course. Venues, this is where a lot of mystery comes into play. And for context, um, for those that are in LA, we're booking usually at El Cid or Resident. Sorry, I'm just grabbing my dog real quick. In New York, we're usually booking at Pianos, Arlene's Grocery, and um, most recently Bowery Ballroom, which is exciting, or Bowery something, yep. Um, awesome, we have a few. San Francisco, we used to book a lot um, at Arcana, not as much anymore, and London, some random ones. So these are kind of based off of my experiences with those venues, how to kind of contact them. Most venues are gonna have either a booking form on their website or a booking email. Sometimes it's not always uh, clear whether it's for just artists to reach out to or as a promoter. Chances are that email is literally like booking at venue.com or whatever. Sometimes it's an individual person. So you can reach out with a little bit of background yourself and a small pitch about the event and ask for any openings and a general timeline. It's going to be really tough to ask for a very specific like Friday or Saturday night sometimes because they have residency or those get booked up a little bit sooner. So I usually like to ask for a general couple ranges. So, hey, my name is Sophie. I, um, I'm i reaching out on behalf of the Luna Collective. We're a magazine, but we also throw concerts across the US. I'm mapping out a show with three to four indie pop artists. Do you have any openings in July? So maybe you don't have your lineup locked in yet, but just so they can get a sense of the genre that you're working in. Maybe you have one artist confirmed, like we're having blah, blah, blah headline, still confirming opening, you know, whatever that looks like. That's kind of a spiel you do not need to email them with paragraphs of information, truly just like a, hi, this is me. This is the show I'm trying to book. These are the dates I'm looking into. They will, and they should get back to you. And that's like I mentioned where that little game begins sometimes of like, hey, I have these dates open, but I can't give you a date until you have your full lineup. So that's when you begin back and forth. Um, when it comes to venue contracts and fees, they will either do two things, um, either some sort of minimum at the door, which you get through ticket sales, and or bar, and then you can get the remaining cut. So one example would be if you clear $400 at the door, you can get all the ticket sales. Uh, on the other end, it could be if you clear a thousand bucks at bar, then you keep all of door sales. So varies venue by venue. And this is where I would encourage you to um, not negotiate, but see what's out there. Some places don't talk about bar, like they keep all of bar. And this is also where it depends like how comfortable you feel pulling in capacity wise, you know, like if you feel like you're going to have a packed house and you know, you're going to contribute a lot to bar, like see if you can get like just 10%. Um, if you're not too confident yet and you're still kind of new to this, like maybe just see what you can get at the beginning and then move from there. Um, there are venues that we've built relationships over time. So we have a smaller fee or a lower thing that we need to clear just because I mean, A, they enjoy working with us or B, they know like, Hey, we're always going to meet like that minimum of bar, door, whatever. So happy to let them keep that in. That's of course on the concert venue side, a more formal side. For those that are interested in doing art shows, that is normally a little bit more of a, a flat hourly rate, you know, whether you're getting through peer space or whatever. Um, and that will include your setup and teardown time. I will say that definitely adds up because for a venue fee, you're thinking, wow, like 400 bucks, like that's a lot. But if the hourly rate for the place you're trying to have it at is... 150 200 bucks and you need to be there six seven hours you know you do the math so it is a little bit nicer being in those more formal spaces because it isn't usually a by the hour thing but then of course um our shows in those type of spaces are super fun and important too in terms of miscellaneous it's always good to know what the venue provides so if you're throwing a show knowing kind of what equipment they have like backline um do they have a drum set do they have amps like do they have mic stands, yada, yada, yada. Do they have a green room? Like anything like that. Um, so if they provide a door person, not all venues provide a door person, or sometimes they will provide it if you uh, pay a fee, or sometimes they prefer you provide a door person. All those kind of like nitty gritty details are very important. Like I mentioned, traditional venues are likely to have more of those things ready for you, whereas spaces for art shows require a little bit more depending on the scale of your event, everything from bar to security. So if you're at a formal concert venue, of course they have a legitimate bar, they have legitimate bartenders. 
Um, I'm sure we've all been to like some DIY art show where it's like a kid at a table pouring like miscellaneous alcohol that that serves a space too. Um, but as you try to get a little bit more um, legitimate about your events and security and safety becomes more of a thing, that's something that you might want to hire out or hire like an actual bartender um, or security. Okay, on the talent end, a little bit similar to the venue outreach, most musical artists will have their booking agent or their contact info on their website. Usually for visual artists, you're just contacting them directly. Um, artists, maybe they have an agent, maybe they just have a manager, or maybe it's just themselves. Usually they'll have it pretty laid out, like management, press, booking, whatever. Um, also, if you can't ever find that online, sign in the DMs. Usually what I'll do is I'll just say like, hey, what's the best email to reach you at for a booking if I couldn't find it online? Um, and then this is where it becomes like similar approach. Just reach out a little bit about your background and then like a one liner about the event. Um, and for musical artists, this is where you want to share a little bit about the pay offer, which I will mention a little bit more shortly. Um, so the key info to really highlight is, you know, date and time, venue, taking and pay additional information. So is the venue 21 up? Do you have other artists in mind? Um, is there a theme, whatever like that. So that's where I would come and say like, Hey, my name is Sophie. I'm reaching out from the Luna collective. We're booking a show at Elsa in August, um, on this date, this time, um, tickets will be $15 advance or $12 advance, 15 door, um, pay for headline is 15% of ticket sales. Venue is 18 and up, like whatever you need to include. Once again, you don't need to include a shit ton of information, but give a, give a high level summary. Oftentimes they might come back to you and say like, Hey, have you thrown any other shows before? Who else is playing? Like, when do you need us to lock in? Like yada, yada. Pretty straightforward though. Okay. Here's where the things get tricky and why probably a lot of you are here promoting your event. How the heck do you get people to show up to the event? And how do you make sure that you cover um, any fees, like cover your ground so you don't have to owe anyone money and you want to make sure that your artists and people participating get paid as well. So obviously you're going to need a flyer and a ticket link. Uh, some concert venues do provide you a ticket link. Others will ask you that you make one. Popular ticket links, as I'm sure you've all used at some point, are like Eventbrite, Ticket Leap, Dice, Party Fools becoming more popular. Um, so getting a ticket link together is key. Of course, you can buy things at door and for art shows, it's not necessarily like the most important thing or things where you expect there to be a lot of walk up. Personally, I just like advanced sales for like peace of mind. Even if it's a very small amount of people are buying in advance, it's nice to just have it there. And it also serves as like your event kind of like a homepage and hub. So I do recommend always making an Instagram size uh, flyer as well as a story flyer size, because that way that's easier to get shared around and passed around to the artists. And usually when I share it with the artists, I'll either put it as a Google Drive or attached and have both sizes. Also, sometimes I play around with different creatives for different artists where it might be featuring each artist a little bit more prominently because they're more likely to share it. Um, paid promos definitely becoming a lot more popular and important for getting people out to shows just because I'm sure many of you know you log on to any app and you're getting flyers for shows left and right. Um, Ticketing platforms are a great way to promote the event itself. So like through Eventbrite, but then of course, Instagram and Facebook ads, those can get super targeted. I hate to compliment Meta, but they make it really easy to set up targeted ads and makes it a lot easier to get an audience and make sure that the right people are viewing your ads. And when I say paid promo, I'm not saying you'd spend hundreds of bucks, like 20, 30 bucks can go a long way. I'm assuming most people here are bomb with no budget and coming from like the DIY space. So truly throwing just like that much, you know, 10, 30, 50 bucks can go a long way. And also TikTok and video promotion has really gone a long way. And that, you know, you can obviously boost that, but I tend to see a lot more success with events that we've boosted or promoted heavily on TikTok or through Reels because that is the new wave and that's what the algorithm is picking up. Uh, in general, let's say we announce a show really far in advance. Maybe it is the six weeks in advance plus, uh, we'll really start ramping up the promotion two weeks leading up and then especially the week of. A lot of people don't buy tickets in advance, myself included. They don't really know what they're doing just yet. So it won't be until like a week or two out is when people, are, it's really on their radar. So that's when I really ramp up that promo and pretty much the week of, that's when you're like plastering in everyone's face. Um, a little hack that I always like to do is having ticket tiers. So like first 50 tickets at a lower price or making it seem like it's limited. So maybe you put up 
20 tickets for 10 bucks and you say in the ticket description, like limited tier, and that creates an incentive for people to act fast by now, because if it's going to be the same price when they show up at the door, why would they buy it in advance? Uh, we always have a separate price for advanced sales and door sales. So I like to keep our shows accessible. So usually it'll be $12 in advance, 15 at the show, more or less, give or take like five bucks. Um, also, once again, incentivizing people to purchase ahead of time. Okay, the boring but super important stuff. Um, and like I mentioned, I did take a class in college. It was all about this stuff. And it was really kind of intense sometimes, but I'm really glad that this was really instilled in me very early on because I've definitely been to events and I'm sure I've, many of you are where I'm like, this is such a fire hazard. And as an attendee, that makes you nervous. But as someone who is the host of something and kind of like the person that's obligated if shit goes down, you definitely take this a lot more seriously. So when it comes to security and alcohol, as I mentioned earlier, crops or venues usually kind of handle all this. They're providing security, usually to check IDs, not necessarily tickets, but they're covering your ass because they need to cover their ass, of course. But as I also mentioned, kind of like DIY or art show venues or like somewhere you rent by hourly might not always provide someone security, but they might strongly recommend or even require you hire a security guard at an hourly rate. There are definitely some peer spaces I've seen where it has said, like, if you're using this for over 20 people, 50 people, like you are required to hire like our security guard for this amount of hours. Um, I know it might add up, but it's definitely worth it. And you know, serving alcohol without a permit is obviously doable. We've all been to the DIY shows, like I mentioned, where it's literally just like a little table and someone in the back making whatever. Um, but just be careful. I'm not going to like sit here and say that that's totally okay. It is illegal. <laughs> Many of the DIY spaces, of course, don't have a liquor license. And so they kind of do the like turn a blind eye, like under the table thing, or you can't technically sell alcohol. So it'll be like donation based. So if you've been to an event before where you, the person says like, please Venmo, but they don't, they can't require it. That's kind of a loophole, but I would advise to avoid that to when possible. Um, safety is really important that the night if something were to happen that was related to someone to drinking, it'd be on your ass, which actually kind of brings us to insurance. So concert venues do have their own insurance and nine times out of 10 will assume liability any of the formal concert venues we've worked with, I've never had to sign some sort of contract saying that we take partial responsibility. Like there have not been any contracts involved um, because they are their own like independent functioning business. On the other hand, other venues, kind of more the DIY spaces or the rent by hours or stuff like that will likely have you have you sign some sort of liability agreement. Um, Usually it's something saying like if any damages to the space incur, like that's on you, like pretty straightforward. Um, may or may not require event insurance. Event insurance seems super scary, but it actually isn't. That's something I've learned a little bit more this year. Um, we had an official South by Southwest showcase and you were required to have event insurance. It was like a hundred bucks or something like that. Like so worth it. Um, obviously add, add it to the list of um, expenses, but I always thought of it as like some crazy expensive weird thing. It really isn't. Um, plenty of places don't require it. So that will be a truly a venue by venue thing, but it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. And then kind of the miscellaneous stuff, definitely walking through and understanding the layout of a place you haven't been to is important, especially maybe if you've attended a concert like many years ago. It's different when you're actually the promoter and you want to understand what kind of everyone's experience would be. I really recommend this for like, the DIY art shows. I'm not trying to like shit on the DIY space. I think it's so important, but I'm sure we've all been to a show where you felt a little unsafe. So definitely walk around, definitely get a vibe, make sure that there are like multiple clear exits. You should never have an event with only one entrance or exit in the room, like big, big no, no, um, avoid places where they could clearly have like a bottleneck effect or have like crowd pains. Do not fuck around with capacity. Like it is just so not worth it. And once again, this is where like having security and people to run door is really important because we don't want like fire hazard situations. It's just so not worth it. So be smart, like use your best judgment. And this is sometimes where you kind of have to be the Karen <laughs> and that's like your job being the responsible one. Um, we've had art shows before where they were like 
very firm about not having people out front. Everyone out front wanted to like smoke their cigarette. This was a show we had in Brooklyn. I'm like, I get it. I know you want to smoke your cigarette out here, but like, I'm just going to be like that annoying narc. That's like, you can't do that because like I'm renting the space. Like my ass is on the line here. Um, don't mess it up for everyone. So that's also the role you're stepping into as the promoter. Like you don't have to be a bad guy per se, but like you're there to bring the hammer down. So use best judgment. If somewhere is unsafe layout or giving you weird vibes or weird area too, like if people are going to be scared going from their car, like down the block, like just reconsider. Like, and I know that's really tough for a lot of cities, LA, especially when so many events are in like the fashion district, like uh, just consider elsewhere and consider things that you can do to make um, the attendance, the attendees experience as safe as possible. Okay. Boring stuff. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay. You got your checklist. So, you know, you want to make sure you know what your offer is with the venue, how much money you need to clear and therefore how much money you might have potentially to pay artists. We do ticket splits for our artists. Usually we will do 50% for headliners, 20% for opening acts. Sometimes we take 10%. I'm going to be completely transparent. If it's a pretty low payout for people, we don't even take a cut. Um, getting an artist paid is most important to us. So figuring out the offer with the venue is important because it allows you to figure out what your offer for all the artists and everyone else can be. Um, if the venue, you just have to clear 300 bucks and you feel like you could sell 100 tickets and you're selling 100 tickets at 15 bucks, then you do the math. That's how much money you have left over to uh, split between the artists. Then you also want to have your ticket link and any assets. You want to have your flyer, your story versions, your video content or everything. And musical artists, when you're booking with them, you want to make sure you know what their tech writer is. So AKA like what equipment do they need? Like what does the venue have? Does the venue not have a drum kit? So therefore the artists need to use a drum kit, but I don't want all four artists bringing a drum kit. So who can share? So like your job is also to be kind of the, um, liaison for that sometimes artists will just like take it upon themselves and like connect with one another and be like hey i'm bringing my guitar i'm bringing the sample and they share other times like you really need to be like the middleman and that's totally okay you also want to make sure you know what the venue needs from you in terms of like staffing like do they have someone running door do they prefer you to provide someone door any of that jazz and also knowing kind of what like the run of show is what time are you allowed to show up what time is sound check yada yada Visual artists, you're going to want to know what they kind of need to have to display their art. Are they allowed to use nails? Are they only losing um, command strips? Do they need to take down their stuff that night after the art show? Like, when can they set up? Um, what's no-nos? What's cool? Like, what's the lighting going to be like for visual artists, too? Like, are they going to have no lighting? Like, should they be bringing their own little spot? Like, like think of all those things. Like, put yourself in the position of the music artist, the visual artist showing up to this event. Like, what do they need to do essentially? And then day of contact. If it's not yourself, making sure that everyone knows who to call, who to call when it's the day of the event, which brings us to our next part. Yes. I like to send kind of everyone like a reminder email of everything that's going on that day. Just very straightforward. Like, Hey everyone looking forward to tonight's show. Um, reminder of details below, like address, the schedule for the night. Here's the person to contact day of like, here's my number here's someone from the venue's number, like just very clear and concise so they can easily pull it up. I do like to always arrive early alongside talent for setup. Genuinely, when I say it's just me sitting there most of the time, it's me sitting there most of the time, but I still think it's important to show face and be there in case any questions come up. Um, and you never know, maybe some something does come up, but I think it's also a great way to connect with the people that you've booked and also the venue. I do like to introduce myself to the venue as well. Um, also the security, a lot of times, like you're kind of going in and out. So just being like, Hey, like I'm the promoter for tonight. Like just, you know, I'll be around. So they recognize you and just being prepared to stand by for anything that could come up. You are the point of contact for on the venue side or the artist side. Um, last but not least enjoy. And I know that sounds crazy, but for any of you that have had an event, that's crazy. It's like, when you have a birthday party when you're a kid and you're almost like so stressed and you want to enjoy it, but it's overwhelming and it's a lot going on. And this is like that, but 4.0, because you are responsible for so much. Um, I remember so many of our events I really couldn't enjoy because I felt like I had to just like be on and go, go, go. And that's why I learned like hire someone else to like run the door. Sophie, like hire someone to run your merch tent. Like your job should just be to be present. Cause that's really hard. And like get content, get pictures, like all that jazz. So Lean onto your community for help so you can like 
be as present as possible for your event because the worst thing is like you have this you put all this effort into it and then you end up like not really remembering it because you were stressed the whole time do I have one more no okay cool I know it was just me like talking for half an hour um and I spelled questions wrong love that um here for any questions that come up I'll stay on for a little bit longer you can put it in the chat you can raise your hand and I can have you come off mute but I hope this was like in the slightest bit helpful obviously everyone's experience is different um but I'd love to hear what everyone thinks yes can you unmute does that work yeah can you hear me yes what's up hi um I have a question about the pay so say you don't like make enough bar or ticket sales are you supposed to pay the difference or like how does that work yeah great question and this is where like being honest and realistic with what you think you can make for capacity is huge um, and we have definitely turned down venues because I'm like there's no way we're going to clear that and I do not want to be out of pocket yeah if you and honestly I will say it does depend on the venue if you need to clear um 400 bucks at door and you didn't clear it nine times out of ten the venue's just like not going to say anything like they're just not going to give you additional money that you won't have to pay the artists of course so you're going to need to figure out how the heck am I getting these artists paid um for bar though usually they'll either take from ticket sales or vice versa um, you're never going to be left with like a bill for the venue per se. It's just more like you won't have a budget or funds to pay the artists, which you're going to need something. So that's where I'd say the out of pocket would come never out of pocket for the venue, but you might need to be out of pocket for the artists just because you don't want them to be making nothing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then do artists usually get like a flat rate outside of like door sales? Some artists do work with like a guarantee essentially. So they're like, I want to make sure that I make 500 bucks and then anything above 500 bucks would be, you know, based on the percentage. I try to avoid that because once again, we're not working at the space where we're having like, you know, hundreds of attendees, like we're working at max 200, 250 capacity. And that's like a great night. So I do like to do um, percentages. It feels like a little bit more low risk on our end and like helps manage expectations if anything, usually when it's banned, like they just want to make sure they can like get everyone paid a little bit. So that's when guaranteeds would come in. Once again, be careful though, be realistic with what makes sense. Also based on your venue deal, if a band is asking for a guarantee of a thousand bucks and you need to clear 400 at door and you're only going to have like, you feel like you could get like 80 people, where are you coming up with this like a thousand bucks? You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good question. And what I would say to that too is this is where booking on off nights is really great. Um, venues will often have very different terms when it's like a Friday, Saturday night versus like a Thursday or Wednesday or something like that. So that's why sometimes you'll see um, more like the smaller promoters have the earlier nights or have week nights because there's a little bit of a lower uh, deal essentially. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? Feel free to put it in the chat or raise the hand function and I'll call on you. Otherwise, I'll put my contact information in the chat. If anyone has additional questions at any point, you're more than welcome to reach out. And if anyone here ends up throwing an event, let me know, come through. Oh, Adam, yes. Let me unmute you. There we go. What's uh, up? Hi, yeah. Uh, I am just curious um, what your experience is with uh, you mentioned there are some, like Peer Space, for example, um, there are some venues that kind of have an upfront rate. And I'm just curious um, what your experience is with like where that funding comes from. Is that, have you dealt with sponsorships or um, yeah, like what? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. And I will admit I've started to stray a little bit away from that because it is a lot of money upfront. Mm -hmm. um, if you are responsible and you're throwing events, you would have multiple events. You have your little event fund, right? So any ticket sales you would make from a previous event, you'd have stored away that you could front as needed for the future event. And it's one thing if you're needing to front like 400 bucks, like maybe you just need to put the deposit down, which is what some uh, more kind of like locally owned, like non-peer space venues will do. We're like, hey, we expect a 20% deposit down to reserve the space. And then like after the show, we'll settle up. So that way you aren't having to front like a thousand bucks. Um, but you raise a good point about sponsorships and partnerships. That is a great way to cut the cost down. Uh, that is what we did for South by this year is we had a co-promoter because there was a lot of money we needed to 
front essentially. And for those that don't know, for South by you do not make any money. Um, so having a co-promoter or a brand or sponsorship is a great way to split the cost on the brand and sponsorship side. What's most common is some sort of product uh, sponsorship or yeah, the co-promotion. So, Hey, um, I'm looking at my Yeti, uh, water bottle, not that you're going to get work with Yeti, but Hey Yeti, we're throwing this event. We'd love to work with you. Um, in return for you sponsoring the venue or providing us X amount of dollars, you'll be on our marketing materials. You can have a booth there, like yada, yada. Um, you've probably seen that. So yes, it's difficult when you're having to front it. That's why yeah, co-promoters brand sponsorships are great, but if you're trying to do something truly on your own, that's where I would try to negotiate, maybe just putting the deposit down rather than having the full balance um, due prior to the event, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, yeah. I have one more that. quick question, sorry, which is uh, you just mentioned insurance and I'm I'm actually curious if you had any recommendations on. Um, yes. I don't know the one off the top of my head because it was provided to me through South by. Um, I will follow up with you. All right, I'll make sure to include it in this um, video description as well. Um, and this was the one that was like 150 bucks. So it was totally worth it. Um, a lot of times venues or like the the owner of the space will have their own recommendation. And I would say it's usually in that range. So it's, they probably want to be working with an insurance place they've used before so that they kind of know the drill and vice versa so that the insurance place knows the venue. So usually they should have a personal recommendation, but I will follow up with you to let you know the one that we use because it was very easy. You, it took like two seconds online to fill it out. Awesome. Yeah, good question. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Anyone else, any other questions? These are really helpful such a mysterious world there's no way to like figure this stuff out until you're in it and I feel like it's scary when you're like I just want to throw an art show for my community but I don't want to pay two thousand dollars and be at risk of like something going wrong <laughs> so okay well I'm gonna stop recording um thank you guys so much for tuning in if anyone has any questions like I mentioned I dropped my email in the chat and can we post it if anyone ends up throwing an event share it with Luna we'd love to help promote this type of community events are super important all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.